Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk. My name is Milan Savic. And my name is Sara Pellegrini. And we gathered here today to un un reveal some unpleasant truths about distributed systems. Uh, yes. Indeed, once upon a time, there was the monolith. And it was uh, EV, not really user-friendly, we know. But uh, it also had uh, some good qualities. It was uh, easy to set up, easy to deploy. So all the code in a single unit. Um, during time, the modern applications have become more and more demanding. And uh, unfortunately, not always, the monolith was uh, able to keep up with the new requirements in terms of uh, flexibility, high availability, scalability. And so we found the solution of uh, all the problems in the world. And of course, the year is 2022, and the solution to all problems, especially to all software problems, are microservices, as you can see here. Uh, we represented them with a set of distributed islands. Uh, joking aside, distributed uh, uh, microservices represent a really good idea. So we want to uh, split our big monolith into several services that uh, do one thing, uh, and they do it pretty well. Uh, we can then scale them differently, we can deploy them differently, have them built in different languages by different teams, etc., etc. However, if we want to make any meaningful business transaction, uh, we need to have those services communicating with each other, which we depicted with this boat here. But there are things that can go wrong. Yeah, seems very cool, but uh, if you look under the surface, a lot of problems can happen. Indeed, uh, dealing with the distributed systems hides uh, several challenges. And first of all, challenges in uh, communication between these autonomous components. The network can be unstable, the other components can be temporarily unavailable. A lot, uh, a huge number of different problems that were not present when we were dealing with the monolith. So we need to add additional complexity to our system. And uh, we need to deal with this complexity for many years. So the question is, is it really worth it? And it's, again, me with all the universal answers in the world. And the answer is, it depends. And we must remember the very first rule uh, about distributed systems, and that is you, sh you shouldn't distribute your system if there is no need to. However, there are some situations with, where we can not just go about distributing our systems. So today, Sarah and I presented uh, two aspects, uh, message dispatching and data storage. We extracted several challenges uh, that arise in those two aspects of distributed systems, and we have some solutions to propose to those challenges. Be in my, uh, have in mind that uh, we couldn't extract all of them as, as challenges and solutions, so this is just something that we find uh, really, really interesting uh, today to discuss. Yeah, message dispatching is the first challenge uh, that uh, you need to deal with uh, when you start distributing your system. And um, there are several things that can happen. So the most important thing is to uh, define the correct design of your application in order to make your components uh, resilient to the communication pitfalls. So let's uh, introduce an example uh, that help us uh, to uh, basically explain the various techniques that we are going to propose uh, today. And this example will accompany us through all the presentation. So let's say that uh, there is a, a customer that wants to buy something in uh, an e-commerce, and this e-commerce is implemented through a distributed uh, system of microservices, each of them with different responsibilities. So let's say that uh, our customer wants to confirm an order, so the system send a confirm or the commands to a certain component, this component verify if it is possible, uh, and publish uh, all the confirmed events to all the other components that are interested in it. And they may react uh, accordingly with their responsibilities in different ways. For example, the orange one can send an email to the customer, the green ones can update some projections. And uh, after that, the, ship and the shipping department um, needs to query the system in order to retrieve the list of confirmed order to ship them. So when we talk about uh, message-driven application, we don't have to deal only with events. We have uh, several important categories of messages. Which one? Yes, as Sarah mentioned, uh, and we saw in the example, there are several types of messages that are going around our system. Uh, the first ones are commands. 
Uh, they represent an intent to change something within our system. Uh, they are routed to a single component and always to a single component. And usually we are just not interested in the outcome. Right? We just want to know whether this uh, command was accepted uh, by, uh, by our system or not. Uh, the other type of messages that we have are events. They represent the fact that something relevant has happened within our system. Uh, they are routed to all interested components, to all interested event handlers. And now these event handlers may uh, tune the pace they want to, uh, to have those events consumed. They may say send in emails, they may, may um, update some projections, etc., etc. Uh, what is important is that they can also do a replay of those events if we store those events uh, durably. And the last, uh, types, uh, that we, the last type of messages that we have are queries. Uh, they represent an inquiry for information. Uh, so once we send a request, we also expect a reply, which is really important. Uh, they might be sent to routed uh, to one single component or to several components if we are dealing with, let's say, scatter-gather uh, type of the query. We want to gather results and then uh, produce some meaning out of them. Uh, and uh, yeah, it is really important to know what is the type of the response that you want to get and what is the actual response. Now, if we line up all those types of messages, we are in distributed systems, all we need to do is just to distribute those messages, right? What could possibly go wrong on a day like this? A lot of things can go wrong, of course. So, first of all, is message not delivered. So, the message uh, cannot reach its uh, destination. And, um, I mean, this can happen for several reasons. The other components can be... Um, offline can be down, uh, there is a network problem in this moment. So let's make an example. Our customer wants to buy something in the uh, e-commerce system, and when it, he clicks uh, on the buy button, the system starts doing several activities. At a certain point, one component sends uh, the payment request command to the payment service. So normally, uh, in the normal situation, what happens is that the payment request reach the destination, the payment service performs the payment, and as a result, a confirmation is sent back to the first component. But in less fortunate case, may happen that the request, the initial request, uh, never receive a confirmation. So it could happen that uh, uh, the request never reaches the destination, or that uh, it reaches the destination, but the confirmation doesn't return to the initial component. So whatever it is the reason, one first solution we can adopt in order to uh, tackle this problem is to implement a retry mechanism. So anytime the um, uh, first component doesn't receive an answer in a certain amount of time or, or when it receives an explicit uh, temporary error, so what we can do is to um, retry the infrastructure that is responsible for dispatching the message can retry another time to send uh, the message to the other component. So this is our first purely technical solution. And you will see that we will use uh, during all the presentation this specific symbol to identify the technical solution and to distinguish them from the design solution. So this is a technical solution and um, it is uh, a technique that you can also refine implementing uh, uh, several uh, retry strategy, like uh, with the ex exponential backoff, for example. So let's move to the next solution. Yeah, uh, the solution is called Circuit Breaker. Uh, always uh, I get to talk about Circuit Breakers because Sarah is not a really big fan of Circuit Breakers. Uh, and that's basically a situation when uh, just retrying does not make sense. Let's say that we have uh, a situation that our buyer wants to buy something in our online shop, it will send a payment request, but this uh, payment provider that we are saying sending payment request is not available. And we know that for a certain period of time it will not be available. So what we can do is just to break the circuit, make a shortcut, uh, and when the next request payment uh, message arrives, we are just going to uh, answer it with, okay, this service is not available. With this, we are going to improve our performances a bit. We are going to reduce the latency, so we are not going to wait. 
but we must be aware that and we hope that our uh, payment provider will become available after a certain period of time, so we must not fool ourselves and never make the request. So from time to time, let's just check whether uh, it is there. Circuit breakers, another, another technical solution that we are adding to our toolbox uh, for the challenge of messages not being delivered. Yeah, another solution is this one. And the reason why I don't like the circuit breaker is because by evolving a little bit further uh, that technique, we can uh, achieve a lot much better solution that is failover mechanism. So basically, when um, uh, this one component is unable to Mm, handle its uh, duties to perform its task, uh, what we can do is basically to redirect all messages that was addressed to, to that component to another instance that we can instantiate on the fly to meet the, these temporary needs, or it can be already be available as a replica of uh, the initial component. So in this way, um, we have another uh, way basically to tackle the problem, and this is the third technical solution that uh, we propose for, our, for this uh, problem of message not delivered. But let's see now how we can handle the problem uh, from the point of view of application design. Yes, finally. We talked about technical and design solutions, and we mentioned only uh, technical solutions. Uh, the very first one here is uh, a deadline. So when we want to make a request for the payment, at the same time we are going to start our timer. We are going to set a deadline for how long we are comfortable with waiting for this reply to arrive. If, however, this reply does not arrive in our expected time, we are going to raise uh, alert. Uh, there is a deadline. This payment has not been done in the time that we anticipated. So what we are going to do, we are going to react on this. So we are going to compensate the initial order, and we are going to cancel it. So in our world, if the payment is not done within 30 days, we are going to cancel it, depending really on the domain. And this is why we say the deadline is a design solution, because depending on the domain, how long we are waiting and how uh, we are going to compensate for this action, uh, it, really, uh, it really is up to our design. And this is the icon that we are going to use uh, for depicting uh, design solutions in our, in our presentation. This uh, covers up all the solutions that we have for the problem of when messages are not delivered, but we have another challenges in front of us. Yeah. Message delivered multiple times. This is another very common problem that you need to deal with when you are uh, developing distributed system. And bear in mind that this problem can also be a consequence of the retry mechanism that we introduced before. So in general, it is basically impossible in a distributed system to say always with certainty the reason uh, why a certain request fails. So it may be uh, several uh, situations, right? It may be that uh, uh, the request never reaches its destination, or it may be that the request reached the destination, it is perfectly handled, but uh, the confirmation never comes back. And the only real thing that we can do to tackle this problem is to build our application in such a way they can tolerate multiple sending of the same message. So let's see how. So the first uh, important rule that uh, uh, strategy that you can use is to um, design your message in an idempotent way. So what does it mean? What is idempotence? Uh, idempotence is a property of some operation such, such that no matter how many times you execute them, you achieve always the same result. So let's make an example. Uh, our friends want to buy a banana. And before to confirm the order, he decided to buy two bananas instead of one. So he opened the cart and increased the number of bananas in the cart. So what happened in the system? Basically, the system sent an increment item number commands that is executed, and the number of bananas goes from one to two. Perfect. But what happened if we send the command twice? So the second time, the command is executed, and the number of bananas goes from two to three. That, of course, is not what our friends wanted. So the problem is uh, here the, the, the fact that increment item number is not an idempotent command. So let's see 
uh, how we can handle the same, how we can res resolve the same problem uh, with using a dampening command. So the problem of this uh, increment item number is that every time it's executed, we achieve a different uh, result. So if instead of using this command, we use a semantically different command, like that update item number, that instead of increase the number of bananas, updates the number of bananas, what happened? The first time it is executed, we have the number of bananas that comes from uh, one to two. And if, by mistake, the same message is delivered twice, the consequences are not really important because the number of banana goes from two to two again. So this is a very powerful uh, technique. Uh, and building your uh, application uh, in order to make your, the execution of your uh, messages idempotent is the key to make them very, very resilient. Let's see another technique. So another technique is to check the status. Here we have, again, uh, a situation where we want to confirm a certain order. Uh, just by receiving this command and uh, publishing an event that order has been confirmed is enough for us. And here I must say that orders in our system have a unique identity. So it is a natural identity for them. If for some reason we have the confirm order command re-delivered to us twice or several times, uh, just by, so it will be handled by an aggregate or some other component that is capable of handling commands, it will load up that certain aggregate uh, based on the order ID, and it will see, OK, but I already confirmed this command. I don't need to do anything more. So I can just drop it on the floor, because I know that publishing a new event that order has been confirmed basically has no meaning. So this is another uh, design solution that we're going to add to our toolbox. We call it here compare and swap. This is something that you may find uh, familiar with in programming languages such as Java, C Sharp, etc., etc. They all support compare and swap operations. But here we say that it is a design solution because it really depends on the domain. What are we going to compare and what are we going to swap or to execute? But there is more that we can do. In a situation where we do not have a natural identity, here we have a warehouse that is uh, storing bananas. We want uh, to deliver two bananas to, to our customer. We are going to receive remove items uh, from, um, from some other client. Uh, we are going to uh, process this uh, command. We are going to publish an event that items have been removed. However, do know that in this situation, we don't have any natural identity. So any banana is the same to any other one. Right? So we are going to process this event. We are going to update the state of our command handling component. Might be an aggregate in this case, to 14. But now we get the same message again. There is no identity. We cannot link this uh, to any um, to any other item. Uh, we cannot use idempotency in this case because we modeled our system. And if we publish the same event twice, we are going to incorrectly update the state. This is not what we want and we can do something else. Yeah. So as Milan said, we do not have a natural identity here. So when we are in this situation, the only thing that we can do is to introduce an artificial identity. So for example, we can use the message identifier of the commands. So the first time that this command is executed, we put this message identifier in a cache that basically uh, remember the commands executing in the last period of time. And uh, in this way, the second times that my mistake, the same command is delivered, we check in the cache, there is already this uh, command, and si simply we ignore the, the, first, the, the command itself. So this technique is called uh, dead application, is uh, the only technical solution that uh, we propose in this context. And um, we suggest to use them uh, only in, uh, when you cannot adopt basically one of the other two solutions. So basically when you do not have a natural identity, and so you cannot basically solve uh, the problem at the design level. So let's see now another problem, another challenge. So another challenge in front of us is what happens if messages are delivered out of order. The reasons for that could be that we are just not using a suitable protocol. Let's say that we are using UDP instead of TCP. UDP, by its nature, does not guarantee the, uh, ordering del uh, the del uh, order of delivery. But it can happen also in cases where we are, for example, using a TCP, which has that guarantee. 
but our structure of the system is done in that way that we have uh, several communication channels between two components, but now we need to order uh, messages across several channels. Sarah is going to cover that in more detail a little bit later. So, uh, the very first thing that we are going to examine here is this situation. Uh, again, we want to confirm the order and we want to request the payment. We are going to confirm the order, order is confirmed, we are going to request the payment, the payment is confirmed. We send those messages in the order that we want. But now, let's say that due to our network configuration or some various reasons, it can happen that we have order, uh, a confirm order command, we have request payment command, we send them one after the other, but they are received in a different order. So, firstly, we uh, confirm the payment, and then we uh, have our order confirmed. Right now, this is not the best situation. It is still functioning, right? But what happens if uh, our order is not confirmed? If we are implementing the uh, online store, it is good for us because we got the money, but we didn't deliver goods. Uh, but for our customers, this is not such a good situation. And let's say that we want to be ethical and we want to be uh, a nice online store. We want to respect our customers and we want to fix this. One way to fix it is basically to chain our messages. So we here have now confirm order and request payment. First, we are going to confirm our order, wait for a response to arrive, and then we are going to send a request payment. Uh, and once that payment is confirmed, we are completely happy. If some of these steps fails, we can still roll back and make some meaningful decision. This is a purely design solution because it really depends on your domain, how you're going to uh, chain your messages. Yeah, there is another solution that is very similar, but different, um, that we can use to enforce basically the order, that is causality. Basically, we can connect uh, uh, this operation through a cause and effect mechanism. So let's see the example to make it more clear. Um, the confirm order command is handled by a certain component that, that publish uh, the order confirmed events. And as a consequence of the order confirmed event itself, there is an handler in the system that requests the payment. So it is impossible that the payment is performed before the order is confirmed, because it is exactly the order confirmation that triggers uh, the payment request. So this is another uh, design solution uh, that we can use to tackle this problem. Uh, let's see now um, a very specific solution that we can uh, uh, use in uh, some uh, special cases. That is it? Uh, it is being lenient. Uh, and now we are going to take a little bit rest from our online store. <laughs> we are going to consider another case. It is a case where we are going to read the temperature from a temperature sensor. We might have some machine that is going to accept those readings uh, and it is going to either display it on the UI or even worse, make some decisions. Let's say that if a temperature goes above a certain threshold, we want to turn on uh, cooling. If it goes below a certain threshold, we want to turn on heating. If messages are received in the wrong order, uh, our system might not function correctly and we might turn on uh, heating where we need to turn on cooling and vice versa. So this is not what we want to do. Uh, we can be lenient and we can uh, basically introduce here a concept of a time window. Uh, we are going to um, gather all the temperature readings in that time window. We are going to impose a reduction function on those values that we receive and then we are going to reason not uh, on all values, but only on the reduced values, uh, value. And hopefully we are going to have a better, uh, better decisions made. Uh, this really uh, depends on our domain, what reduction function we are going to use here, how we are going to reason about those. Uh, and this is exactly what we depict here. We are adding being lenient as a design solution to our uh, toolbox. So there are certain cases, as Milan said before, where we can take advantage of uh, the communication protocol to enforce the ordering of messages. So in this case, for example, we have two components. So to enforce the ordering of messages that goes from orange component to the blue one, we can use a TCP channel, and that's it. Easy. But what uh, if we need to scale up the blue component with a second instance? So in this case, we have two uh, autonomous blue component that operate concurrently, two channels, so we cannot guarantee the ordering uh, with the 
uh, in this way. So what uh, um, we can do is to decide to dispatch all the messages that, are, uh, uh, that needed to be uh, handled sequentially to the same instance using a consistent hashing algorithm that basically um, read the, as a key the property inside your message that represents the sequentiality that we, we want to follow. So let's make an example to be more clear. In our e-commerce example, um, we maybe want to uh, process sequentially all the um, messages related to the same customer. We don't care about the sequentiality between messages that are about two different customers, but we want to keep uh, a strict order for all the messages for the same customer. So what we can say is, uh, I decided to dispatch all messages related to even customer codes to the first instance, and all messages related to odd customer codes to the second instance. In this way, I am sure that all the messages for the same customer code will reach the same destination, and so the TCP channel will guarantee the order. So that is pretty cool, but it is not always applicable. What if, for example, we, need, we decided instead of scaling up the, the blue component to split the blue component in two completely new components, the black one and the green one, and these two components as different responsibility handle different uh, messages. So what happens if I need uh, to guarantee the sequentiality between two messages that must be necessarily be delivered to uh, two different components? So in this case, this technique doesn't work. So there is no technical solution that can, in absolute, solve this problem uh, of message delivery in the wrong order. So it is a good idea to use these uh, technical solutions, such as transport protocol together with the consistent hashing mechanism. But uh, it's always a good idea when you need to enforce a sequentiality to uh, also take advantage of one of the other uh, design solutions that we introduced before. So let's tackle now another problem that is when non-functional requirements change. This is something that nobody likes, but let's say that now we have our monolith, and now there is a separate team that wants to take care of this thread component, or let's say that we just want to scale it out differently. Now, maybe that's an order component. We are getting a lot of orders. This is good for us, uh, and we want to have more instances capable of handling uh, order requests, and we do not want to scale out the whole monolith because uh, resourceful, uh, it is not, uh, how to say, uh, mindful uh, to our resources. What is important when our non-functional requirements, uh, requirements change is that our functional requirements do not change. So we want to lock any code related to the business logic, and we want to keep that the same. So if we change our uh, infrastructural components, we don't want to change our business code as well. There is one uh, interesting technique uh, that is called location transparency that can help us a lot uh, in this situation. Yeah, the location transparency is basically a, a technique that requires uh, that a component is not aware of the location of any other component it interacts with. Even better, if uh, any component doesn't even know about the existence of other components. So what can uh, um, a component, what can do a component? So a component can express its needs, uh, basically sending a command or many commands to the rest of the world. It can also share uh, some facts to the rest of the world, sending events. But uh, it is not directly uh, aware of who is interested in these messages. Now let's try to exemplify how uh, location transparency works in practice. Here we have two components. They want to communicate with each other. One way is just directly sending message from one component to the other. But unfortunately, this is not a location transparent way because purple component must know about the location of the blue one. So how to deal with this one? We're going to introduce another infrastructural component. Uh, we are going to call it a message bus. Uh, and uh, the message bus in this case is responsible for distributing messages from one uh, component to the other. Uh, having this uh, component present in our system, we can uh, draw boundaries around our uh, functional components uh, clearer. Uh, and we can say that 
Now, inside our band, inside our component, our context, we are going to speak a specific language. Uh, we do not care about the rest of the world. We do not care about uh, other components. We just care about messages that are present in our system. So if you want to talk to a blue component, we do not know that there is a blue component. We know there is a certain command that can be handled by some component. It might be blue, might be some other component. And we are going to uh, tell to our message bus, OK, here is a message, just deliver it somewhere. And message bus will do exactly that. It will know uh, what are the components that are capable of handling this uh, specific message, and it will deliver it. If you are inside a monolith, this is pretty easy, right? But uh, when we go to um, distributed system environment, the only thing that we need to change is the implementation of the bus and not the implementation of our uh, business logic components. Yeah, and this is really, really powerful because uh, uh, basically, mm, this allows us to evolve our deployment strategies um, during time when, if the needs are changing, and they are usually changing. So let's say that uh, at the very beginning of the development, uh, we don't want to deal with the complexity of a distributed system. So we prefer to deploy everything in a single monolith that is well structured and contains inside uh, the different components. And, um, during this phase, these components inside the monolith can communicate each other, basically sending messages to each other through a message bus implementation that is able to dispatch messages inside the same executable. And when and if the, the need arises, so what we can do is to detach a component, basically, and to deploy it in, a, in another microservices separated from the monolith, and in this case, we don't have to change any line of code from the business logic. The only thing that we need to do is to replace the implementation of the message bus that was able to deliver messages only inside the same executable. Now we want something that uh, can deliver messages across distributed microservices. So that is a, a very powerful technique, and uh, um, it starts uh, basically from uh, defining a very good API that is able to completely separate the business logic from the infrastructure that uh, uh, is responsible for dispatching messages, that is basically the message bus. In this way, uh, when the need arises, you can uh, basically change the implementation, evolve the implementation of the message buses, keeping your business logic exactly the same. So let's talk now about the, the problem that we always leave at last. Yes, of course. Performance is something that we always think when we uh, deploy our system to production and then we see that it is not up to par with uh, our load that we have on our system or maybe the network configuration that we made is not so perfect or maybe just our business process by its nature is slow. Uh, but there are other components that do not expect it to be slow, so they may um, send a lot of requests to it just to uh, try to be processed in a faster way, which in essence cannot be done at all. The first thing that we're going to talk about it, uh, how to solve this, how to improve performance in our system is streaming. Instead of sending a request waiting for a reply, sending another request waiting for a reply, uh, basically sequentializing our requests and replies, which of course is slower. We're going to introduce two uh, streams of messages, one from component one to component two, and the other one from component two to component one. Uh, this way, uh, communication flow, message flow is much faster. Uh, we are going to gain uh, on performance, and now we just need to have some correlation between those messages to know, okay, for this specific request, this is the response, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So streaming is something uh, that we call here a design solution. It it is, you can consider it as a technical solution. But if you design your APIs in a requ request reply way, then Evolving further to a streaming is much difficult because, because this is your API. There are some other components that depend on this API. If you start changing your API, other components are not going to have a good time. So maybe you have to keep uh, for a certain period of time two APIs to have a fallback, etc., etc. This is something that you do not want. So you must start with a good API, 
that supports streaming. The underlying protocol might support streaming, might not. If it does not support streaming, then we don't have performance gains, but we are at much better uh, starting point than, um, than we uh, have with a request reply. So let's say that you want to start with the streaming API. Yeah, and it seems pretty cool, and it is cool, but uh, uh, it is also, of course, when you um, consume the messages in a, in a stream, you speed up the system. But you must be very sure that uh, all the components in the pipeline are able to support the uh, pace of incoming message to tolerate the, the speed of incoming message. Because if only one of these components is unable to tolerate the speed, the consequences are pretty obvious. So we call this uh, family of problem impedance mismatch. So, uh, what we can do to solve this kind of problem is, um, let's say that we have a component that is not very performant, and uh, um, for a certain period of time is under a load that is uh, higher than what is expected. So our component, what can do? It can buffer the messages, the incoming messages, for a certain period of time, but if this load continues for too long, this component ends up collapsing. So basically, what we can do is to introduce a back pressure mechanism. In this case, it's not the first component that pushes messages toward the second one, but it's the second component that pulls, basically, this messaging at uh, its pace. So this is a, a very important technique uh, um, that we, we need to be aware when we deal with streams, but uh, it is not always a solution applicable because there are certain business uh, where is it, it is better to crash than to slow down the application. So keep that in mind. And let's see the last um, solution about this topic. Yeah, so one other way to improve our uh, streaming architecture is to uh, introduce batches. It is something that we all know it's pretty uh, uh, simple to explain. So I'm just going to go over it like this truck. Uh, so we have uh, a batch of messages. Uh, we are going to wait until this batch is full, and then we are going to send them uh, all to destination. Just by sending all those messages at once and not sending them one by one, we'll reduce a lot of, uh, uh, basically, we'll reduce a footprint on the wire. So instead of having all those metadata and headers attached to each message, we are just going to attach that to a batch, and we are going to distribute the whole match, batch. Essentially, we are going to improve our performance. And with batching, we completed uh, all solutions to our performance challenge. We completed all the talk that we wanted uh, about the message dispatching solutions. And now we are going to talk a little bit about data storage. Uh, this is something that we usually take for granted. Data is stored, but of course, we want that data to be always available. In order for data to be available, we must replicate data to several machines. So if one machine is down, there are other machines that can uh, serve us. Essentially, this is a distributed system, which has a lot of challenges as well. Uh, and now we're going to talk about several of them. All solutions to these challenges are technical ones. We don't want to impose any design solution because we don't want to leak uh, problems of distributing data storage to our applications. We don't want to limit our application to a specific uh, data storage. The first challenge that we're going to talk about is data availability. We know that today data is gold. We want to mine it as we mine gold. Uh, and it has to be always there. So what we can do, Sarah, about data availability? So of course, if we have a single instance, a single database instance where our data are stored, we have a single point of failure. So any time, uh, this instance is down, the data are not available either. So the solution is very simple, as Milan said. What we need to do is to replicate the data across uh, several instances. Uh, in this way, any time I have one instance that is down, there are no problems, I can connect to other instances uh, and to retrieve data. Unfortunately, um, distribute basically replicating data across uh, uh, several instances and guarantee the consistency between these instances is not so easy. Lucky for us, there are consensus algorithms that can help. Yeah. There are people who are thinking about these problems. Uh, so solution, one of the solutions for having data replicated safely and consistently are distributed consensus uh, algorithms. Uh, 
they are not that, how to say, maybe interesting to uh, uh, application designer, but they are really important to, to be understood uh, in order to have your database configured correctly. So here we have a set of clients. We have a cluster of servers. When a client wants to store something, it will send a request to one of the servers. That server is going to write that request to its transaction log, and it will replicate this, um, this information across the cluster. Once a certain amount of servers confirm that this is a successful replication, we are going to consider this data item committed, which basically is a really important point in time in which we can say that this data item is going to be available as long as our cluster of servers is available. Uh, now, we can safely use that information because it was committed. We can uh, safely apply it to our state machine. If we are a database, we are just going to durably uh, store it to disk. And we can reply to our client, OK, everything is good. As long as cluster servers is available, everything is going to be available. Uh, having in mind that transaction log is the same on all machines, uh, that uh, state machine is um, uh, implemented in the same way and it is uh, done in a deterministic way. Basically drives us to a conclusion that the data is going to be the same on all servers. We chose a specific implementation for the product that we are dealing with. Yeah, yeah. In Axonic, we decided to use uh, Raft for implementing our products because uh, uh, mainly for uh, its understandability. Uh, and uh, Raft is basically a consensus protocol that is based of the, on the absolute majority of nodes that must always be available in order to have the cluster available as a whole. So when it comes to uh, data availability, the only blade we have in our uh, Swiss knife is uh, uh, replication, basically replicate the data across multiple instances. So that's the only solution that we, we propose for that problem. Yes, again, me talking about performance. Uh, it is really important that your data store is uh, performing well. Uh, the very first thing that we can do is to layer our storage. So here we have two layers, primary and secondary layer. Uh, primary layer is put on uh, fast SSD disks uh, that are not that big. And secondary layer is put on disks that are uh, cheaper, but they have uh, a bigger amount of storage. So when we want to replicate our data, we send it to the primary, primary stores it, uh, replicates it to the secondary, we continue doing so. But after a certain period of time, uh, when we want to continue with the replication, uh, we are going to do the same stuff. But on the primary node, we are going to say, OK, let's remove all data. We have certain retention uh, period or certain re retention size, uh, and we're going to start removing data. Why? Because we assume that uh, if your system um, is functioning, uh, it will usually use the most recent data. So it will go to the primary, which is faster. Uh, but in case where it needs to access historical data, it is still available, so it can go uh, to a secondary node and read data from that one. Just by having this configuration, we are going to improve uh, our performance. So uh, adding, uh, story, sorry. <laughs> adding uh, storage layers as one uh, tool to our toolbox for solving performance issues. Yeah, and horizontal scalability, of course, is another solution that we can adopt, uh, mainly when we have uh, um, high load in a reading operation, because, of course, we said that uh, the data are the same across the several instances, so we can read from any instance, having multiple instances. Uh, instances can help uh, in, um, of course, uh, uh, in case of heavy load in reading operation. Unfortunately, if you use Raft, this is not true for writing operation. Because with Raft, all the time that uh, we do a writing operation, we need to go through the leader, and the write operation must be acknowledged by the majority of the nodes. So increasing the number of uh, nodes is not an effective solution to horizontally scale uh, writing uh, load. And horizontal scalability is uh, another solution that we can use. Let's see the last one. So the last one is sharding. Uh, basically, it has a similar idea as uh, layering the storage. If our servers need to deal with uh, less data, it will perform 
the whole system will perform much faster. So what is the idea behind it? Uh, each server has a certain value assigned to it. So it is called a sharding key. And each server knows how to calculate the sharding key for the incoming date. Uh, if those two values match, it will store it uh, durably on its uh, hard disk. If they do not match, then the corresponding server will know to which server to route this data to. Um, this is something that we have not implemented, so I'm just <laughs> talking here <laughs> because it's fun. Uh, because we just <laughs> <laughs> because we just do not have any necessity so far. So this is also a really important lesson. Do not implement a technique because it is cool and, and awesome, uh, but uh, because you really need to do so. And with this, we ended uh, all challenges and all solutions to those two aspects, to uh, message dispatching and to data storage. And now there are some things that we want to give you for a uh, takeaway. Yeah, we have seen several uh, techniques for several problems. Of course, we didn't cover everything. But uh, there is a common denominator, uh, let's say a principle uh, that um, for us is important and we would like that uh, you take away from uh, this talk. So we saw two types of solutions. Uh, ones are technical solutions, so they have nothing to do with how you design your system. And the other type is design solutions. So they are really, really uh, important in the aspect how you design your system. Uh, what we want to underline is that not always a technical solution is the best one. Uh, if you strive, uh, and we as developers usually strive to seek for the uh, technical solution, and we start implementing it, we are going to complicate our code base, uh, our system might in the end not have any benefits from it. I know it's hard, <laughs> but sometimes it is much better to talk to your business experts and see whether uh, we can uh, relax certain rules, whether we can accept additional step in our business process, etc., uh, etc. Et so let's strive for design solutions if possible. Of course, it is not always possible to do so. Yeah, and finally, be reactive. Of course, this is a, a way of life. It includes uh, a lot of things, but uh, today we want to stress the first three reactive principles. So stay responsive. Embrace the asynchronous approach and not only uh, handling the happy path, but also uh, detecting errors and dealing with errors. Uh, the other thing is to accept uncertainty. Once we are in single deployable, in single JVM, in single uh, deployable unit, uh, we know that our messages are going to be delivered. There is only one instance. But if we need uh, to go across uh, at the boundaries of our system, if you go, if you must go on the wire, then a lot of things are uncertain. Whether messages are going to be delivered uh, at all, in which order, uh, what is the performance of that, whether we can wait for a certain period of time or, or not. So it is pretty uncertain. If we use tools that try to mask these uncertainties, saying, okay, it is always going to be here, just invoke the method, and behind this method there, there are a lot of service calls. It's usually not a good thing. So we want to accept this uncertainty, and we want to basically bake it into our design. We want to design our systems having this uncertainty in mind. Yeah, and this third point is very connected with the, the last one that Milan explained. So. Um, Embrace the failure. So the failure is not uh, an exceptional situation. It's just one of the multiple paths that our application can follow. And uh, it must be um, designed, it must be explicitly represented in our application exactly as the uh, success, uh, the happy path, uh, with the same importance of the happy path. And we, with this, it's all. This is our... Twitter account if you want to uh, contact us later, or otherwise we are here around. Yeah, we're going to be here tomorrow as well. Yeah. Thank you. No. Okay.